course. I will uh, wait, uh, restart again. I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the scholarship application workshops. So this workshop uh, is doing under the joint IFSA IUFRO Task Force on Forest yeah. Education in the term 2021 to 2023. So before we go to our workshop session, we will have some introduction about what is IUFRO, what is IFSA, and what is the joint task force and um, having some introduction of our speakers. So let's start with the IUFRO introduction. For Dr. Sandra, please take your time. Hello, everyone. Good morning from Mexico. And um, I know it's evening and afternoon for some of you. Um, I want to thank you to, for you to participate in this um, very important webinar organized for the students. To me, it's an honor to be part of this team. And I also want to thank my colleagues, Dr. Sheila Ward and Dr. Fola Babandola, for taking the time to prepare and present that information that we hope is going to be useful for you. I would like to introduce IUFRO. IUFRO is an organization, it's a global network, nonprofit and non-government uh, that works on their voluntary basis. It, it hosts around 15,000 scientists from around, one, from around 120 countries. And the members are uh, research of the organizations, forest research organizations uh, for, Six, 600 members, uh, pretty much. The headquarters is in Vienna, Austria. Uh, the organization was found uh, uh, around one, 155 years ago, if I'm not wrong. <laughs> um, and the organization is dedicated to uh, connect, uh, to reunite scientists, um, for, for scientists to share a uh, forest science among us and also to improve what we have been done uh, in previous um, in research, to advance in research. Next, please. Next slide, okay. Oh, no, the previous one. Okay, and as you can read, the vision of IUFRO is to be the voice, a global voice of forest science that promotes sustainable future of forest and society. Uh, we are members of the uh, scientific council uh, and also the way that we work is uh, with, the way that we networking is through uh, events uh, like congresses, um, regional congresses, symposiums, meetings, scientific meetings, this kind of webinars, and any kind of meeting related to science, for science. Um, we have, the organization is divided in divisions. We have nine divisions. Each division addresses different topics of for science. Like for example, the division six is on social aspects of forest science. And I mentioned this division because it's the division where the joint IUFRO IXA tax force on forest education is host. Uh, we also have tax forces. Tax forces are created to <clears throat> uh, take a research that, or topics that have been uh, underdeveloped uh, at large. So that's why this tax force is important because there is few research on forest education. Um, we established the tax force in 2015. Next one. And I will pass the voice to Annie, who is the co-coordinator from AIFSA SAI and she will introduce the tax force. Annie? Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I hope I, I'm audible. 
So um, I'm the coordinator from the FSI for the uh, GTF. So um, the main objectives of the GTF is to encourage international discussions on forestry education and capacity building among students uh, and to identify and compile the communication gaps, uh, the challenges in forestry, and um, to especially highlight uh, new fields of forestry education and to enhance uh, forestry students' mobility and um, education opportunities. So um, in short, our objective is to enhance forestry education uh, for all forestry students, whether in bachelor's or master's or in PhD, all around the world. That is our basic objective. Um, next slide, please. Um, so um, now I would like to introduce you to the IUFRO um, Congress uh, 2024 happening in Stockholm next year. Um, it's, it's, it's the conference, um, it's the pr uh, primary most conference um, of IUFRO and um, we are having um, plenty of um, supplementary sessions as well as technical sessions. Abstracts uh, are open for all the technical sessions and the deadline to submit the abstracts is um, June 2nd of this year. And you can find more details uh, in the website given on the slides. Um, next slide, please. So um, the, uh, this, this is the Congress uh, where all the scientific community uh, gathers together to discuss uh, on forestry. It is an event of um, collaboration and innovation and um, where we discuss the scientific solutions for a sustainable future. Um, over 5,000 5, uh, scientists from all around the world will be attending it. And all these stakeholders in forestry will also be uh, participants. So um, please be there to join us next year for the IFO conference in Stockholm. Uh, next slide, please. Benning, next slide, please. So um, from the JTF side, we will be having um, three, oh, no, previous slide, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so from the JTF side, we will be having um, three sessions. Uh, first is a supplementary on how to incorporate indigenous and local knowledge in forestry education. Uh, and we are having two um, technical sessions, one on climate action for forest education uh, which is in association with EFSA, and the other one is um, teaching and training in silviculture, contemporary challenges and future pro uh, prospects. I think it's in association with Division 6 of IEFRO. So um, please, uh, please join us next year for the conference. Um, I hand over to Wenning to, um, to give the introduction on EFSA. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, Dr. Sanda, and thank you, Annie, for the introduction. So we have known about IUFRO and we have known about the opportunity, the great opportunity about the World Congress in Stockholm for next year. So please, everyone, uh, submit your abstract uh, within the next month. So, and then let's get know about IFSA. What is IFSA? So IFSA is the larger is international association for students of forestry and related fields. So, and it is established, officially established in 1990 by motivated students that organizing student symposium since 1973. So, uh, we have similarities between IUPRO and also IFSA. So, IFSA vision itself is over the appreciated forest. So from uh, from our vision, uh, we make our mission through like enriching our members' education through the international events, networking, and intercultural exchange. And we have three main goals. The first is international networking, and then enable students to engage globally as a forestry student and take the learning beyond the education. Uh, 
So yes, that's how uh, if so, let's move to the aim of this session so, uh, before we enter the main session. So the aim of this session is to providing the knowledge and information about how to write a good personal statements and research proposal as part of the application process for a scholarship. Second, uh, it's providing knowledge and information on how to prepare for and address interview questions as part of the selection process for scholarship. And the last is shared experiences on graduate education at master's and doctoral level program. Before of that, please, uh, we have some rules that we need to follow. So we highly recommend you to keep your microphone turned off during the presentations. And for during the Q&A, as we know that uh, it will be probably many questions. So just write your uh, questions on the chat box and we will try uh, to address when it is possible. And don't worry, we will, uh, if your question is not being answered, we will keep it and get back to you. Thank you. And let's meet our speakers. So before we move to the events, we will uh, I will give you introduction about uh, our speakers today. So for the first, we have Dr. Sheila Ward. She is the executive advisor on international uh, in in how to say in she is part of the yes this is the executive uh, advisor. So let me write uh, her curriculum. So he just graduated her PhD on UC Davis in ecology, living in Puerto Rico for 29 years old. So she also like two time Fulbright scholars to Mexico and conducting her research about the genetic of the mahogany and Spanish cheddar in Puerto Rico and Mexico. So also like in Belize, she investigates the impact of the ancient Maya on tropical forest ecology. Then let's move to the Dr. Fola Bobalola. So Dr. Fola has won more than 20 research grants that uh, include Global Environment Facility, Small Grants Program, Explorer Grant, International Foundation for Science uh, for his PhD and Joint Fellowship of Afornet for his master. Moreover, like she has, he has a lot that I have said that more than 20 research is, and it's just an uh, one uh, several that he got. Then let uh, we move to our main session. So for our main session, uh, Dr. Fola will present about writing the personal statement for the scholarship. So for the, for Dr. Fola, please take your time. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Wherever you are hearing me today. I am so happy. She, I appreciate the uh, IFSA for giving me this platform to do what I always love to do, and is to always talk to the junior one, the young guys, and to always want to share my experience, my idea. And so this uh, afternoon, here it is afternoon where I am currently, uh, where I'm currently at, uh, and. I'm quickly going to make this presentation. Let me ask again, how many minutes do I have, please? So in maximum, you have 45 minutes, Mr. Okay, all right. So thank you so much once again. Please, can you all see my slide? Yes, absolutely. Okay, that's good. So um, today, I'm speaking to the young people who are into forestry. I'm speaking to my colleagues in forestry, and I've been uh, introduced. My name is uh, Paula Babalola. I'm currently an associate professor of forest social economics at the University of Finland here in Nigeria. And I've been practicing forestry for more than 15 years. So I'm glad to be part of you all today because I was once an um, IFSA member and I, uh, also went to study forestry, my BSc, my MSc and PhD, they are all in forestry. And now I belong to UFRO. I'm also a deputy coordinator for forest education. So I welcome Sandra and I welcome everybody. And I also welcome Dr. Sheila Ward for being my co-resource uh, co person for today. So let's kick start. Let's go straight 
to the business of today. Now, we want to talk about personal statement writing or writing of personal statements. And if I will ask you, I don't know how many of you that have been able to write one or two personal statements in it in previously, and some of you might have written something before, and some of you may even be planning to write one. So let's go together and see what personal statement is all about. And I'll give you a guide on how you can write your own effective personal statement. Start calling your message. Okay, please kindly let us mute ourselves. Now, what is personal statement? Most of the time, I will, you'll be seeing PS on the slide. So PS is also an acronym for personal statement. Personal statement is just an essay written about yourself. It is something you write about who you are. And it's something you write or where you came from. Your background is, tells you about your dream. It tells you about your aspiration. It tells you about your goal. And it also tells it, it is focused more on your strengths. It focuses more on what you are made of. And you are writing a personal statement, maybe to seek a scholarship or to seek a postgraduate sponsorship. You also write personal statement, maybe you want to seek a research grant. All in one, you want to use it to seek for money or for a sponsorship or an assistance. I've been able to write some of these things previously and a number of you, as I said, we also be planning to write it. So let's keep going on. Now, an effective personal statement will give a clear sense of your personality, what you are made of. I've said that before. And also, it also tells us on how you want to use your personality to develop your future or your goal, or how you have used it to respond to some, maybe some opportunity in the past or some challenges that you have faced in the past. So we want to use all this combined together is about your past in order to secure your future. So that is what personal statement is all about. Now, what are some other terms that we use in place of the word personal statement? As you can see on this slide, we have some terms that some scholarships committee or sponsoring body may use in place of the word personal statement. Some can call it statement of purpose. This is very popular, SOP. You see a number of people saying SOP, SOP. So it tells a boy, it, it can be, they can mention the word statement of purpose, or they can call it personal motivation. It can also be motivation letter or letter of motivation. Some other granting bodies may call it personal essay or reflective essay or narrative essay. So all these terminology, they are all pointing at the same thing. It's just the way you structure it that is going to determine what you are pursuing. Now, what you should keep in mind about personal statement? What you should know about personal statements? A personal statement is a picture. It gives a picture, number one. And you see, this picture, what do I mean by this? It provides a snapshot of who you are as a person. What you are as a person. So it's giving us what we call a kind of snapshot of you, a picture of you, looking back and going forward. Now, number two is an invitation, an invitation for your reader to know, to get to know you, to know you. We want to know you. We want to know who you are because you will not be there when they are reading this personal statement. So it's going to be about you and who you are. So that is what personal statement again is all about. And number three is an indication of your priorities and judgment. What are your priorities in life? What are your priority for the future? So your priority and ability to design and pursue them effectively. What is about how do you give judgment about who you are or what you have passed through? You are good, you are, you have been, you will be the one that will be your you own judge. You will be the one that is going to give an exposition about yourself. So that is what the a personal statement is again. And number three is a story. More precisely, your story. So a personal statement is a story. You are going to tell them a story. 
So if you have not been writing a story before, you want to write one about yourself. So it allows you the room to be creative and meaningful in your self-reflection. How do you reflect on yourself? Who you are in the past? So it takes a, a, little, a little effort in trying to write that story. So even if you're a science student, you are not an art student or somebody who has done literature before, you are going to be one. You are going to put yourself in one when you are writing the past. So you have to develop the skill on how to write this. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. what past yeah. statement is not. Now, for the next two slides, I want to let us know what personal statement is and what personal statement is not. We need to get this right very well because this is where some of the students or some of the applicants miss it. Now, let's quickly look at what personal statement is not. Number one is not a resume in narrative form. You know, some of us, when we want to write a personal statement, you go back to your resume, you go back to your CV, and you want to summarize it again in trying to write a personal statement. That is wrong. So a personal statement must reveal and interpret well beyond the resume or well beyond a CV. Other part of your CV or other part of your application might have indicated what is in your CV and they could have read it there. But in the personal statement, it is more of a story, as I said, it's more of a narrative. So it is not going to now use in writing your CV or your, your resume all over again. No. So other parts of your application would have done that. Now, number two is, it's not a journey entry, a journal entry. We are not talking about a journal. We are not talking about your diary. So a common mistake is allowing your personal statement to also read like your diary. It's not just a chronological uh, presentation of your uh, um, CV again. So you should share only relevant material selectively, or those that have not, you have not been able to say in your application, but they are personal to you. Now that's what you write in your personal statement. Number three, it's not a plea or a justification. In personal statement, you don't beg. You don't try to defend what is incorrect or an assertion so that you are more worthy than all you, are, you don't want to criticize us other people that you are better than any other person. All this one can backfire later. So you are not just going to self-justify yourself to criticize others or to run down other people. No, focus on yourself. And number three, uh, the last one here, it's not an academic paper with you as the subject. What do I mean by this? The objective distance of academic writing disengages the reader from you or in a personal statement. So you don't just write it like an academic paper. You write it interesting. You have more flexible and not rigid writing personal statement. Are we still all with me? Are you all with me? Let me get feedback. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, all right. Sir. Now, let's go on. Following the prompt, that's the next thing I want to talk about the personal. What is a prompt? Or what are prompts? Prompt simply means topic given to guide you in writing your personal statement. Granting body or the scholarship committee might have written something, a topic like giving you an exam question and they want you to answer it. So prompt can be like exam question. Prompt can be like a topic. So when given the prompt, it is important that you stick to read and answer it carefully. You don't just want to write your personal statement looking like what you want to write, simply because it sounds better to you or because you already have a standard scholarship personal statement you have written before. Even if you have something written before or you have something customized before, when you are answering a personal statement or a prompt pertaining to an application, you have to make sure that you apply it to the present application you are applying to. So don't just write it because it sounds better. This looks good, look good to you. No, it may, it may look good to you, but not answering what you have been asked to write. 
So don't just write it like what you really want to. So you have like the I can add it that they normally say that he who pays pipe pipe dictate the tone. So you must try to fulfill the answers or the prompt being posed to you. So answers the prompt that is given and answer it honestly and completely. Let's move on. Let me now give you an example of common prompt, prompts. Common prompt. Now, example of question that they may ask or an example of a prompt that may be posed to you whenever you come across different application may use different uh, prompt or different question. But the common one are some of these ones that I have here. They might ask you, why do you deserve this scholarship? That's a prompt, that's a question. That will form the basis of your personal statement. Or they can say, tell us about how you overcome greatest challenge in your life. That could be the personal statement. That could be the prompt you have been asked to write. Or they may ask you, why do you want to attend the college? Or why is education important to you? Or why do you want to attend this university? Or why do you want to partake in this program? Explain why this program is applicable to you. Those are prompts. Or they may even ask, what, uh, what maybe is your favorite redo and why? That's another prompt. And interestingly, look at a question being posed by Yale uh, University to their applicant one of the previous years. A Yale ask, how will you spend a free weekend if you are given one? Then they don't want to see how, how, how you, you, you can really spend your time. How do you want to spend your time? How can you spare, spend your spare time, free time? And you must be very careful in the way you answer this kind of a prompt because they don't want to see something that is whiling away time without keeping in check with your education. So these are some of the example of a common prompt that you may uh, that may be posed to you when you are writing your personal statement. But among these prompts, let us look at two very in detail because I, I always like to be very practical when I'm giving my examples. Now, let's take this first prompt. Why do you deserve a scholarship? Why do you deserve this scholarship? They ask you to write a personal statement or statement of purpose, SOP, or they ask you to write your essay. What I will advise is that this is probably the most commonly asked prompt for any scholarships. They normally have this one. Why do you deserve it? The most institution that gives scholarship know why you want the scholarship. They already know that you want to pursue a PhD or you want, you want to pursue a master or you want to pursue a program or maybe a fellowship. They already know you want to come for it. But the only thing that they don't know is why exactly they should give you the sponsorship or the money. Then it is left for you to convince them. So your answer to this prompt should be one that fully answer the question by telling the scholarship committee not only why you deserve it, the money, why you deserve the money. It is not only that, but also why you need it. So let me quickly point these two keywords to you. Why you deserve something is quite different from why you need something. Let me say again, deserve and need, they are two different things. So you should be very careful when you are answering the word deserve and need. So when you are writing for why you deserve a scholarship, you should be able to know why you deserve something and why you need something. Let's move on. So let us quickly pick those two words and look at them in detail. The difference between why you need something and why you deserve something. Now, let's quickly pick the need first. The reason, the need simply means the reason that you need the scholarship money. And this could be, it could be involve a number of factors. It could be based on a number of factors. Let me give you an example. Maybe financial hardship in your family is, it could constitute a need because you don't have good financial background at home. And number two is coming from a simple parent or maybe foster parent. Your, maybe one of your parents dead and then 
you only have only one left, which is struggling to even feed you and your rest of the family. That could be a, a need again, why you need scholarship. Another need is maybe you have older siblings already at college or in a university. And so the money is going to that one and they cannot sponsor you. That's a need. Another need could also be maybe your parent is disabled, they are not working, or they are incarcerated and all that. That is another need that could make you want a scholarship. And another one is coming from a low income family or a low income neighborhood. And that could be another need. Why you don't have the money? Why you don't have the resources to pursue to that issue? And you, can you see what need is? And lastly, it may even be, it may be being a, you are a ward of the state with no support system. Where you are coming from, the country you are coming from, maybe they don't give funding, they don't give scholarship. They, there are no, no resources that is going to education like that. Like I will give an example of my country in Nigeria that they don't really have more scholarship for university students or college students. So those can, this can also, they, all this can come together to constitute the need why you want the scholarship. So these are all needs. Now let's go to the second one, which is more of how the desire. But before I get there, the need, when you are writing needs, telling the scholarship body that, uh, you need something. It's not just feeling sorry for yourself. It's different from you begging for help. It's just simply telling them the reason why you need the money. So always all this one, they are legitimate reason. You could potentially need help by, from, by paying your university uh, funding. So these are some of the reasons you can give and they are legitimate. They, they are the one that you use to really convince people that I am in their need of this thing. So, but you just have to be careful the way you put it, that like you won't put it in a begging state. Like you are, you are totally helpless. You know, some people can write things like, I'm totally helpless. Yeah, I, 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 I'm dying without this. I have no future. You, you must just give me. No, you don't write personal statement like that in order to justify your need. And as long as you are being honest, you have to be honest when you are writing, you are presenting the need. You have to be very careful. You have to be very honest. Don't lie about it. Don't call yourself what you are not. So these are definitely things that you should uh, include in your uh, PS. Now, let me go to deserve. Why you deserve something? Why you deserve something is quite different from why you need something. In deserving something, this is the part of the personal statement where you will sell yourself, where you will tell the committee that this is how potential I am. This is my quality. This is what I have achieved. It's about your achievements. So telling about all the great things you have done, all the great things you have achieved is about deserving the scholarship is what can put you in the state of deserving the scholarship. Why they should give it to you? Why their investment will not be a waste? So you can see that that is deserving something. So some reason why you deserve a scholarship could include the following. Let me give you an example. Maybe you are a first class student, or you are the best graduating student, or you have a recognized award, or you are outstanding, you have outstanding record in your academic result in your your academic result, or maybe community service you have rendered. Maybe some of you have gone for your NYSC and you are able to achieve something. The state recognize you, or the NYSC recognize you, or your community recognize you is an outstanding result or achievement. That may be the reason why you deserve a scholarship, so that they will see you as a potential investment. You are not going to be a waste. Another thing is impressive personal story of overcoming an adversity. It could be another reason why you deserve something so that their investment cannot be a waste. And also maybe lastly, an exceptional, you may be an exceptional athlete or a sport person. You know, sports on athlete is now a big investment abroad in the US, in Europe, in the UK. It's a very big investment. And if they know a student with an exceptional ability in sports, is coming to their university, you can contribute to monetary gain or to some of these achievements of the university also. Because they know when you are part of the team, the team can always win. 
And the more they win, they can always attract funding or they can always attract record to that institution. So it's another reason why you may justify the reason why you deserve scholarship. So you can see the difference between the need and deserving something. So let me say it again. The need may be some of those part of you that put you in a disadvantaged position. That is the need. But when you are talking about deserve, deserve is an achievement. Deserve is just a selling part of you, something that makes you outstanding, that makes you stand out among others. So try and look at these two when you are writing your personal statement on why you need a scholarship or why you deserve a scholarship. Now, let us look at another example, another prompt in writing your personal statement. They give you this question. Why do you want to attend a college? Or why do you want to attend a university? Or it can be twisted in another way. Let me ask it, why is education important to you? All this is pointing to maybe your, your, the reason why you don't go to university or the reason why you want to attend an, an, a, a college or why is education important to your future? So this is another very popular question that may be asked in scholarship application and could form the prompt for your personal statement. Now, a scholarship committee wants to know in this question, they want to know why you have actual or obtainable goals for your education or for your future before they give you money to use for your college or for the university. So they want to, they want to really know what is your obtainable goals? What is, what are, what will be the contribution of this education or going to this institution we, 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 we have, what are the impact that we have on your future? So it is not left to you to convince them in your personal statement on why you need it or why you deserve it. So if you can't effectively explain why university or college education is important for your future goals, then the community may not want to give you or give you a chance by what do you do, scholarship. Now, let me quickly look at what you need to know in answering the question on why you want to attend a university or why education is important. You can focus, in answering this question, you can focus on maybe the hard, how hard the generation that came before you have fought for you or for your generation to be able to attend college and how you want to honor that. So maybe the previous generation you came from, your background, your father, maybe your great grandfather, your family, your town, or people around you, how they have suffered, how they, they did not have access to education, or how they have been able to, for, to fight for the existence of education. And then how you can now key into this, their fight, for their fight not to be in vain. That is why education is important to you. You can go, take that approach. Another approach is you can also take maybe a wholly personal approach in answering the question. For example, you can mention any relevant struggle you've been through, or maybe you don't, you, you, you don't need to be afraid in talking about your family in this area, in answering this question. You, you, you can be open up and telling them, maybe, Maybe none of your family member um, went to school and how they have even, even those ones that have gone to university, how they've been able to struggle before they pass out. This can be another reason why you want the scholarship to be able to provide for your own success and smooth education. So if not, you can also discuss maybe an honor it would be for you to be the first person in your family to graduate from the college. That if they give you the scholarship, you will be the first person that will graduate if you're able to go to university or in the entire community, on the entire neighborhood. So how is it going to be a motivation for other students, for other youth or other children in the neighborhood? How it can be a motivation for them if you're able to pass out or you're able to have the college or university education? That cannot be another reason why you can write, how you can write the personal statement. So those types of things are very good in writing your reason why education can support your future. Another thing is no matter which way you decide to go, which with your answer to this question, don't forget to talk about your goal 
don't forget to talk about your goal. When you are trying to convince them, always target it to your own personal goal, your future. And how college or education is the only way for you to achieve that goal. So always bring this in your statement. So be specific. Talk about your intended major. Maybe you want to, what's that subject you want to go for? Maybe it's forestry, environment, climate, pause, or anything. You have to be specific and attach whatever you are saying to it. So don't just distance yourself. Don't just, that is why, you know, when I started the other time, I said, you don't just write it because it's good to you. No, you must always bring in all these examples to fit into what you're applying for. So always match them together. Always find a meeting point whenever you are writing your personal statement. And this will help you in achieving whatever you want to achieve. In life. So if you are applying for a university specific scholarship, talk about why you want to go to that specific university. You can go online, go and Google, go visit university website. You know, a number of students, a number of applicants, you want to apply to university and you have never visited their website, that is wrong. If you want to apply to Cambridge, you want to apply to Yale, you want to apply to Oxford, you want to apply for Stanford, visit their website, visit the program, read about the program, read about their research focus, read about what they are into, read about their academics, read about their staff. Make sure you acquaint yourself, you, are, you know about everything about them. That will guide you in whatever you want to write and in using it as a justification for your personal statement or for your education. So please make sure you visit the website, know everything about the program and let this feature and merge it into your personal statement. Now, let me quickly go into tips on writing personal statement. What are some of those tips that are I want to quickly give you. This will be the last session, and I'm quickly going to rush over is about 13 of them. So number one, make a draft without character or words. You know, a number of times when you have been given, when you are given a personal statement or statement of purpose they write. For example, if they tell you, you have to write 4,000 characters, or they can say, you should write maybe 500 words. You don't start by writing and following the character, no. First, start with a draft. Pour out everything in your mind, excuse me. Write everything out. It can go as high as 7,000 words. Don't, be, don't, don't mind that, it's a draft. So start with a draft without the character or the word count. Then after you finish the draft, then you start deleting your necessary words. Start compressing it to be able to fit into the 4,000. Or, excuse me, or it can go to 3,999. They mean only one character, one word. So please start with a draft. Don't start with character or word count. That's number one. Number two, take your time. Don't rush. Don't wait till the last minute in writing it. A superb personal statement will not be ready in a couple of hours or even in a couple of days. Take your time. Sometimes it may take a you, you, it may take days, it may take weeks. So when you even start a draft, you can take a break from the draft, give it like one or two days, come back to it, fresh memory will come, and then you can write it fresh. So take your time, number two. Number three, use perfect words and expressions. Let it let, try as much as possible to learn some grammar, some specific words to replace some common words. So it sounds more professional. For example, if you use your word like accomplish, rather than to say I, to say I do, or you can use word like presume rather than saying I think. I can say I presumed, or I accomplish. Not that I did this, I did that. I accomplished this. That's another thing. So use some perfect words or expression in your personal statement. Try to use word translator. Words that can translate, or maybe you can start consulting synonyms. What word can I use in place of these common words on the internet? You can use Google Translate to achieve this. But one thing you should be very careful with, don't overdo it. Don't try to use too many fancy words in writing. It may piss some people off, it may be a distraction. So be minimal in the use of 
some perfect words or some expression in your personal statement. Number four, do specific examples to illustrate your ideas. If you have an idea, as much as possible, use stories, use examples. Being too vague or writing too general will not make your personal statement stand out. Use concrete examples of maybe demonstrate how you have been able to uh, achieve maybe a motivation or you have been able to achieve a leadership. So if you want to prove a motivation or you want to prove a leadership, give an example of maybe a position you have achieved in the past, a position you have occupied in the past, how you have been able to uh, make a uh, result or get results in those leadership positions, have those leadership help you to overcome challenges or how you have engaged in disorder. We have distraction. So be as much as possible, use concrete example in driving your point home. That is what I'm trying to say. So you should need, you also need to show how you have assigned maybe meaning to your experiences and how you have grown from them. So in telling stories, in giving examples, try to give out how it's trying to tell people practical experiences you have in the past, you have achieved in the past. So prove that you have a sense of who you are or where you are going and how you are going to use your education and your experiences to accomplish your goals. And goals. So you should be able to give example, use example of what you have achieved in the past, what you have undergone in the past, and then that could be a justification of how you can achieve or repeat the same thing in the future. So it is usually better to focus on recent events than very old events. So as much as possible, bring in closer events, closer example than giving example of 50 years or 10 years or when you can have something of two years or a few months in the past. Now, number five is concentrate on your strengths, not on your weaknesses. What you can offer than what you cannot offer or what you can get. So you should write about your experiences, your knowledge, your future plans, and use example to, to support it in order to drive your point. Be careful not to write a negative report about yourself. For example, I, I want to learn French, but I give it up after a week. It's just a negative statement about yourself. Or I am not very good in mathematics, but I think this is understandable since I, I, I ate it so much. That is a negative thing to say about yourself. Even if you don't like mathematics, you don't need to say that. You must find a better way of saying it or things like that. But most importantly, concentrate on your strengths than your weakness. And then number, let's go to number six. Number six is find the perfect opening sentence for your personal statement. Opening your personal statement is very, very important. How you open it is very important because it's going to determine maybe they should continue to read it or they should dump it. So starting with something interesting, something unusual, something surprising, we give a good first impression about yourself. But do not try to squeeze that thing out of your mind. When you are writing the first draft, that thing may not come. You may not get it that moment. So just keep writing. So when you keep writing, you keep writing, the perfect opening sentence will eventually come up. After you have written it, maybe you have spent hours or some days. Then you will see what you want to copy and take to the front and then use it as an opening sentence. So very, very important. Perfect opening sentence is good. So, so just wait and do not overthink before you start. Don't say, because I don't have the good opening sentence yet, I will not start writing. No, 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 no. Start writing. Before you get to the end, that sentence may come, and then you just take it to the front and you start your personal statement with it. Very important. Do not copy. Make it your own idea. It is advisable to read as many personal statements as possible. Go online. You will see samples upon samples upon a sample. Those samples you are reading is just to give you an idea of how it is being written. You know, most of us, we did not wake up one day and start writing. 
It takes you effort of reading what other people have done, what they have written, then in order to perfect your own writing style. So, but when you have read other people's own, don't just copy sentences, copy paragraphs, and put it in your own and think it's your own. That will backfire later. So you should not copy, but you should just try and use to generate idea. So it will simply give a false impression of yourself if you copy. You are most definitely unique. You are definitely unique. So it is worthless for you to copy somebody else's idea. So when you read other people's personal statement, just understand the idea in writing your own. After all, this is about you, not somebody else. Now, number eight, be honest. Be honest, be open. In the way you write, if you are honest, if you are open, it will flow. So do not write that you are fluent in something that you cannot, like you are fluent in a language, maybe English or in French or in Spanish. Or you cannot just say something you are not. You have read the number of people when they are writing their summary about your, about their, um, a summary about their profession. You see pro people saying I'm problem solving, I am articulate, I am this, I am that, without even knowing the meaning of that word they are putting in their CV. Do not write what you are not when you are cannot defend. So if you are good, you are good the way you are. Just try to know that. Number nine, be careful. Be care, clear, be focused, be organized. In writing, be clear. Be focused, be organized. Make sure your peers follows a logical structure. Let it be chronological, let it follow the storyline flows. Try to think about how it may sound to maybe an audience who doesn't know you. Read it and read it. Let it focus, let it, let it flow. So getting input from people you trust, maybe your teacher, your friend, your relatives can also help you to look at how organized this article is. Now, number 10, get somebody to proofread your peers. Give it to somebody you trust. Give your peers for your parent, maybe to your parent, to your teacher, your friend to read for you. They can spot those grammar that you may not see. They can spot the flow. They can see maybe it's disjointed. So, and other errors may be detected by other people. You know, when you read something a couple of times, you may not see it, others can pick it from you. So the more people you show it to, the more feedback you can get, and then you can have a better writing. So of course, be very careful who you give it to. Some people may discourage you and may not want you to write. So be very careful who you give it to and the, how you handle the feedback. Some advice will be better and some less. So, but it is now easier to ask many people. It is better to ask people than not ask people, but write the right thing. Another thing that may, you may use again is you may even use computer software. You can use English or grammar checks like Grammarly, MS Word, or AutoCorrect in order to check your grammar. So that's another good thing you should use. And then number 11, read it out many times. Excuse me, sir. How many minutes Just more? You know. Yeah, you have one minute left, actually. Okay, no, I'm rounding off. Now, read it out loud to yourself. Read it out. There are some things when you read them out, you'll be able to detect some errors in them. So read it out. And I think this is getting to the last line. Once you submit your application, stop reading it. Forget it. You have sent it, you have sent it. The more you continue to read, the more you think it is not good enough. So once you have submitted it, forget it and wait for the response. After you get the offer you wanted, you will know that your application was just perfect the way you want it. I appreciate you for giving me the platform to talk once again today. Thank you all for listening. My name is Dr. Kola. Thank you. You are on time, sir. Thank you so much for uh, presenting those and for all the tips. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're just getting a, an important knowledge about being a deserved person rather than just a neat person. Exactly. So helpful. And yes, maybe we can uh, implement it to our master and PhD degree. So after, the, uh, after this presentation, we will have about uh, introduction to uh, research proposal. 
that it's very useful when we want to apply for a master and PhD. So for Dr. Sheila Ward, please take your time. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh -huh. that visible to people? So I just see like the word has started screen sharing in there, but it's still not. I'm sorry, you are still mute, that part. Oh. Yes, it's feasible. Uh, I'm so sorry, doctor, you are still mute. Please turn on your camera, your microphone. Thank you, sorry. Well, greetings to everyone from San Juan, Puerto Rico, where I live in the Caribbean. And I'm just going to um, have a lot of information I wanna share with you today. And I won't be able to get to all the points in the slides, but I'm, I'm gonna ask the organizers for this meeting to share everything, to share this presentation with you so that you can peruse it at your leisure. Um, I want to thank Dr. Fola for a great explication of how to write that personal statement. And I'm gonna move on then to talk to you about proposal writing and some other aspects perhaps that may help with developing your fellowship application. Okay, first I wanna talk a little bit about the International Society of Tropical Foresters, um, which I am here as the executive officer of. Uh, we have about 2,100 members in 109 countries and 10 chapters around the world. We are an information sharing collaborative network and our goal is to promote the conservation and sustainable use of tropical forest resources. ISTF is free to join at the global level, although chapters may have dues, and you can send me an email at tropicalforesters at gmail.com if you'd like the membership form. Okay, so this is my talk outline for today. I'm gonna to cover strategies for applying for fellowships and writing proposals, just kind of an overview on that. Where is the money that might you, where might you locate information on these kinds of funding sources and other funding sources? the parts of a research proposal, a little bit on letters of recommendation, something about proposal reviews to so know what your proposal went through to be reviewed, what happens if you get the award and what to do if you don't, and then post-award, you have to think about reporting. Okay, so strategies for fellowship applications. Well, fellowship applications are, um, provides support for research and study, and they're highly competitive, as Dr. Fola explained. Um, you, so we're gonna look at, you want to explore fellowship funding opportunities and select and apply for several of them. You want to research the program requirements for reporting, restrictions, deadlines. You need to get good letters of recommendation from people with experience in your field and who know about you. And you need to follow all the directions for the applications with care. Okay, I'm trying to, sorry. Okay, so then going on from the, the proposal is one component within the proposal, I mean, within the fellowship application. So with this, you want to start early and think about what your end goal is. First thing, thing is, what kind of proposal are you wanting to write? Even considering a research proposal for a fellowship, there's two general categories you wanna consider outside of that zone. There are the research proposals, which are based on questions, hypotheses, and test the hypotheses to answer the questions. Another category of proposals that's very important is to meet a particular need, maybe for equipment construction, education programs, maybe community development, a particular project for tree planting, for example. Whatever kind of proposal you're writing, 
you need to first define your goal. What is it you want to do? Then you need to develop your strategic plan for achieving that goal. You need to look at the funders that you've located. You need to look at all the background information you can find on them, often from their websites, on the funder's mission. And then within their funding, within that funder, they may have several programs. And you need to look at the particular goals you're applying for, uh, the, the particular goals of the program you're applying for, including a fellowship program or the fellowship programs that you find. And you need to construct your argument carefully to get the funding for your project or research. You need to show how your research will help the funder meet their goals to convince that the funder that your effort is, deserves funding. Okay, so um, let me see, sorry. Okay, so when you're writing a research proposal, you will have questions, you will have activities that will help you answer those questions, and there's a budget. There's money that you're going to ask for to carry out those activities. So you've got to make sure those are aligned. Um, that the budget will will is what you need to support those activities to answer the questions. So you should be planning your research and the budget in parallel. If you're funded, you are the funder's agent in the world, even for a fellowship proposal to help them reach their goals. So. You need to pay, when you're looking at the funding, um, description of the funding opportunity, including for fellowship applications, you need to pay attention to how they're gonna evaluate the proposal. It's good to find a friend, a buddy or a group with whom you can do the proposal preparation and review each other's proposals. And when you write a proposal, they'll give you limited space, like full up discussed for the um, personal statement, Every sentence and every word must count. Follow the instructions rigorously and make sure you are meeting all the requirements. Use a good writing style, good paragraph construction, proper grammar and proper English. And what the, the overall title that you choose, make sure it will, it's not so specialized that, um, uh, you, that most people can't understand it. Make sure this title will speak to a broad audience for your proposal app for your proposal title. Okay, so let's go on to where is the money? How are you gonna get, how are you gonna find the money for these fellowship programs? How are you gonna find money for research programs in general or for carrying out projects? Well, for fellowships, many graduate programs um, have fellowships that accompany them, especially for international students. But sometimes it's hard to find those international funding opportunities. So you might want to consult. I have here, there's several categories of things you might want to look at. There's paid directories. Maybe your school has a subscription to something like the Foundation Center or Instrumental or other for free funding directories um, that are listed here, the links. And you'll get this um, PowerPoint, so don't bother to copy anything down. But you can check these for basic information. I also, following this slide is a list of free directories um, for hard for international pro projects that include information for other project, uh, international projects. And there's other strategies also. Okay, so here's a list of free directories. Check these over, see what they have to tell you about a research project you might be interested in, an, uh, another kind of needs-based project or for a fellowship application. And another strategy is sometimes you can sign up for free newsletters from certain um, funding uh, funding sor information sources, and they will tell you about uh, new funding opportunities coming up. For example, the Grant Station newsletter, you can sign up for the international edition. You can also look at the websites of particular funding sources to see who they have funded in the past, um, and that can help you out. And you can look at these other um, strategies for yourselves. So let's go on to the parts of a research proposal. Now, the parts that are listed here will probably vary depending on the funding source for the research uh, program or for the fellowship program. But overall, a, I think a reasonable set of things to consider include this overall summary or abstract, an overview with the problem statement and gap in knowledge, the, the questions and hypotheses, significance of your what you want to do, 
the context or background to the research problem, the activities or methodologies you will use to answer the questions. Um, you need to clearly explain your methods, relate them to the hypotheses, look at possible problems and anticipate your findings. Then a little bit on how the proposed research will relate to your future goals. You may need to include a management plan I'm sorry, Dr. Sheila, your presentation is off. Okay. Sorry, the connection periodically gives out here. I will I will keep trying. Okay, so let's go on to I went over these um the the there the other things you need to think about are the budget that we discussed, a timeline for your activities. Maybe there will be a logic model theory of change that they'll require. Maybe they'll require monitoring and evaluation. Okay, so the abstract or summary of the proposal. This will probably this would be a short summary that may be posted in a public place, and it should be a concise summary that relates to the funder's goals, and it should be the last thing that you write. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, yes, so, oh, but I've got to change to full view here. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, so then we will go to your audible. So please with everyone. So I think that Dr. Sheila having a bad connection again. So please kindly wait. And okay, please wait. Uh, she will come back. So don't worry about the materials and the recording because we will upload all the materials, also the recording for this session on a three a learning web page on the IFSA. So just go to https of ifsa.net and you can find in in, the, in there on the web page of the project on the three learning and we will also send you a, a notification to your email so don't worry everyone and i will write also on the chat box so you can visit the website Okay, Dr. Sheila is in here again. I'm really sorry about that. I don't know why I keep popping out. I will try again. And if this totally goes belly up, I'll send the PowerPoint and you can share it with everybody. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes, it's visible. Okay. So we were going on to the proposal overview. Um, this is how I've got approximate pages listed. I've got approximate pages listed about what's required for different sections, but you'll want to scale them a proportional to what um, how much space they're a lot you're allowed um, in the um, by the funder. So the proposal overview is the section where you sell your your project or your research project to the funder. The first paragraph. In the first paragraph, a good way to work with it is to first um, identify the knowledge gap that your research will address. What is your research going to do that we don't know already? And um, you need to indicate also how that research gap links to the funder's 
objectives, their overall goals. And that will help address, we also need to know why this gap is important. Then in the second paragraph, tell us how your proposed research will meet this gap and what will be possible when we have that knowledge that we can't do now. How will it, how, what, what's gonna be possible after we have that missing piece of information that your research proposal is gonna find? The third paragraph can state your central question and that would be derived from the knowledge gap. Then give a short summary of the conceptual framework that to show how your work, the proposed, the work you wanna do, your research question fits into current work by others. The fourth um, paragraph, um, tell how you are equipped to carry out this research, show rather than tell. Do you have any related research experience that will be um, that shows that you can do the, the project. Okay, so now we have a page, um, maybe a page less on questions and hypotheses. Take that central question and break it down into sub questions or objectives. Okay, and I would go for two to four sub questions. I'll focus on a rigorous approach, and you may even want to try going for cutting edge questions. Then for each sub question, give alternate hypotheses about what you think might answer the question, the hypotheses that you're gonna test. Efficient science is testing multiple hypotheses at the same time. Then show briefly where these hypotheses came from, the conceptual framework behind them. And then each question that you want to answer will probably have two, three activities associated with it that will help to get to the answer. Okay, so I have an example here. It's not a great example, but you can think of better ones. And we don't have time for a practice, but I want you after we're done here to go back and think about what is a knowledge gap that you're interested in. So I'm saying there's an unidentified cause of tree mortality in tree pl teak plantations in Sri Lanka. What central question, what is causing the mortality? Then I have several sub questions here and some alternate hypotheses that aren't very good either, but at least there's something there for you to think about. And the challenge is for you to do a better job than I've done here. Alternate hypotheses about what might be causing the mortality. Okay, so let's go on to the significance. Okay, so this is an expansion of that little bit that you had in the overview of what will be possible when the research gap is bridged, when the gap in knowledge is bridged. What further scientific development will be promoted? Okay, then we go to the context or the background. This is kind of a little more expansive. Now, these are what came before was short sections that someone can read quickly and get the idea of what you're gonna, what you're about. So the context, the background should explain more on why this is an important research issue to address. Um, you can start with the historical overview of the issue and summarize the most important research and, um, and observations from the past and bring the reader up, bring the review, because people are gonna read these proposals and you're trying to sell this research to the reviewer. You want them to say, hey, we want you to fund this. So try to bring the re reader up to the current edge of the current knowledge. And then you wanna further develop the conceptual framework around the central question that you posed, the sub questions and the alternate hypothesis, these. You can bring in here, if you can bring in here work by yourself or your lab, that's great because it indicates more about your capacity to do the, to do the, to carry out the proposal. So when you make the case for your research, every statement you put in there needs to build the case for it. Don't use references, don't use information that detours from the central issue of what your research is about. And as far as you can, use data to support the importance of the research problem. And like I said, your preliminary data is great if you have some to share. Okay, so then you've gone through, you've explained why this is important. You've given it some background. Now, what are you gonna do to try to answer those questions? Well, 
Let's see, let's say that I think a good way to organize your activities is by the particular question that they're gonna be directed towards, okay? So you may have three sub questions, then you're gonna list activities, A, B, C under each one that are gonna help get at part of testing of those alternate hypotheses. And the activities should be as concrete and specific as possible. You need to use up-to-date references for the methodology and analysis. You have to think about what can you realistically do and the time and money that you have available. And do you or your collaborators have the necessary skills and knowledge to carry it all out? Do you have the other pieces in place, like the necessary equipment? Do you have the vehicle you need to get to the field? All the things that you need to make it happen. Then think about the potential obstacles to getting the project done, getting the research done, and how you might solve those obstacles. And think about also about the anticipated findings, what you think that you're, the direction your research might take, take you. Okay, so then you've, you've described what you want to do. You've given specifics about the activities. Now, you this is for a fellowship and even for some other larger research endeavors, they want to hear about how your research plan connects to your career track. So consider where you want to be in 10 years and how the proposed research will help you get there. Okay, so then this part here may or may not be come into a fellowship research proposal, probably not, but it's a good piece to know about anyway because it comes in with many larger types of research proposals. You need to put in something about how you're gonna manage your research project, the organization you are a part of, the NGO, the academic institution, or if it's a business that's putting in a research proposal. What is the organization to do, able to do and its strengths to carry out the planned activities? Your qualifications, the qualifications of other personnel to carry out those activities. What are the responsibilities of each person? Is there gonna be an external advisory committee? How are you gonna carry out the meetings and co communications among various partners if it's a complex project? And again, stating something about solutions for shortfalls. Okay, and a, a really important part that I mentioned already that you want to develop at the same time you're developing the activities is the budget, okay? Now, maybe this won't come in so importantly for a, a research proposal because you may be just allotted a fixed amount, but you still need to think about how much money is all this gonna cost and how do I make it work? So determine the amount of money you need for activities that will achieve your, the objectives or answer the questions. Plan your budget at the same time you plan your activities, what do you need for each activity? How much is it going to cost? Base your budget design on the temp. Look at what the, the funder requires you to include in the budget and base your budget on the template and guidelines that they give you. Start with a whole amount that you can ask for and then work back there to how much of the activities you can include. And that will even influence what research questions at the end you can include. Okay, try to be as specific as you can and as realistic as you can about the budget components and costs. And you'll need probably, if, if it's a multi-year program, you'll need to break it down into um, parcel it out the budget for each year that you need for the program or for the research project. Okay, so this is just a bonehead example of how you, you have a budget here for one question or objective, and this doesn't relate, but to this here, but it's about forest restoration. What specific um, costs will be in years one, two, and three to carry out that forest restoration tree planting plan? Okay. And then there's something called the budget justification. And this is more likely to turn up in larger, more complex proposals. So you're not only gonna have a budget that you're gonna lay out on a spreadsheet, but you gotta say why you need that money, okay? And line item, each item. Organize it in the same order as the, as the items on the budget sheet, and it gives you a place to give additional detail to justify why you need that item. And make sure you follow the guidelines again from the funder, and you need to show that all costs are reasonable and consistent. And if you can show a, a sensible budget justification, it can help you get the whole amount that you are asking for. Another thing I believe that you will need as well for most fellowship applications is a timeline. The start and end time of your research, you need to make sure that your activities will align with the time periods available and the annual budgets. And the timeline should be as concrete and as specific as possible. 
What really can you do in each time period? What is necessary to accomplish the activities to answer the questions? So I would think of it this way, timeline for activities or um, to achieve objectives or, or answer the questions. You can think in terms of steps by each year, what you need um, then to the activities under each question and what you can accomplish in each year of each activity. Okay, now I'm gonna give you a couple of sections, some sections that you should hear about um, if you're gonna be doing um, research in your life. Um, they, these probably won't show up um, or if you're gonna be carrying out other kinds of projects. Some organizations do require these components I'm gonna list now for a research plan. Some of them um, just require them for um, needs-based projects, okay? Like carrying out a tree planting effort. Okay, so you should understand the difference between outcomes, out, outputs, outcomes, and impact, okay? And I've listed here information. I'm not gonna go through these things in great detail. These are here for you to peruse on your own as you are progressing through your career path and so that you have more information available to you when you're coming into participating, you might help your major professor or someone you're working with with a big proposal. And it's good to know something about these other kinds of components that are needed for proposals. Okay, so another thing you need to do is make linkage between the goals, the objectives, the activities to meet those objectives or goal, or, and then which lead to certain kinds of outputs like number of trees planted, but then the output is not the same as the outcomes or impacts, as I stated already. Um, the outcome would be more like the tree. Can you hear me? Um, yes, but can we please just move the slide? It will be like a number 20 slide, but we still on uh, the proposal overview. Proposal overview? Yeah. Oh, no. It's okay, I'm moving only... them, but you can't it's see only... them, huh? Can you see them now? Uh, it's still in a proposal of review. Okay, I'm going to stop the share and start over. My goodness, am I having trouble today? Sorry about this. Okay, so I'll share the screen again. Oh, okay. Can you see that now? Can you? Oh. Okay, it will be like on tw 20. Or I can help with the share screen also. Can you see the screen? Yes, it's in the timeline screen. screen. Can you see the timeline screen? Yes. I'm so sorry, everybody. I'm so sorry, but the slides, everything shows up when, when you'll see it all when you get it sent to you. Okay, so is Don this? Can you see this slide that says goals, objectives, activities? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, we're made progress here. Okay, so um, this then is the. Um, okay, this is just something, some kind of background information you need more for. Uh, regular project proposals, not necessarily research proposals. Okay, another thing you're gonna wanna know about is logic models and theory of change. So the next few slides is about that, okay? So remember that you're gonna need to know what logic models and theories of change are to include them in various kinds of proposals. And logic models and theory of change involve indicators, targets, baselines, and milestones. And you need that information because another important component of larger scale proposals that may even show up in research is an evaluation plan. How are you progressing on implementing a project or carrying out the research that you want to do? This won't be particular for a fellowship proposal, but these things are important for you guys for the future. So please, when you, I'll let you guys take a look at this on your own, this part of it, okay? So I'm gonna move on now to letters. So those were additional components to put into a proposal, usually of a needs-based type 
but I'm sure that a lot of you, if not most of you, are going to be putting in those kinds of proposals at some point in your career. So now let's go back to consider something about letters of recommendation for fellowship proposals. These are really critical that you get strong letters, okay? And you, I've got this information here also because you need to consider yourself, look at yourself and consider your own strengths in these areas in which you are likely to be evaluated by a recommender and think, hmm, I need to learn how to work independently some more, okay? That you maybe, this may help you evaluate your own strengths and weaknesses to see where you need to kind of work on things some. So recommenders can assess you on your basic mastery of the field, your motivation to pursue your goals, your ability to work independently, your ability to work in a research team, your ability to carry and conduct carry out, plan and carry out a, 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 an independent research project, your imagination and originality of thought, your leadership potential, your skills and originality while well, research design again, your skills in the laboratory, your ability to communicate, and the growth they've seen you, you go through during a period in which they've known you may be working in their lab. So all these things are important uh, to know, think about yourself, where do you think you stand in these different components? Where do you need to work on yourself? And we're all capable of growth. We're all capable of, of developing ourselves further. And it's good to identify kind of where our strengths and weaknesses lie. And that'll help us think about how to get a good recommendation if we can demonstrate more of those skills. Okay, now a letter of recommendations will need to be usually by somebody who knows you relatively well. Um, they should, the reference should include the length of time they've known you, the nature of the relationship and their ability to assess your skills. And then your skills and strengths that you can have demonstrated to indicate your success in a rigorous research oriented environment in the future, if you're in a graduate program. And then again, your ability to work in teams or independently, your personal integrity and maturity. And they probably will, you know, most people, most, um, programs will ask them to indicate what they think maybe your weaknesses are as well. So that package went in. It went in with the proposal and you've got the letters and that personal statement and all those other components that the, uh, the, the fellowship program was asking you for. Now it's good to know something about how proposals are reviewed. How are they looked at by your prospective funder? They get this big stack of stuff, you know, now what do they do with it? Okay, now usually in calls for proposals, they include um, the, the criteria, okay, the review criteria, the basis for selecting who gets funded and who doesn't. And if it's a larger foundation, like um, let's say you're applying for a Ford Fellowship, Foundation Fellowship, or something from like, a, like maybe um, a German, fellowship fund, the German government has felt international fellowship funds, they will tend to be include expert, um, an external panel of review by experts, these larger entities. And then there may be a program officer who makes the final decision on who's going to get those um, funds for either that fellowship or a research program. Now, one thing to keep in mind then is when you're writing your research proposal, you are writing it for those reviewers. You are writing it for those reviewers to understand what you wanna do and that they think it's gonna help that foundation or agency or whoever meet their goals, okay? So you have to think of who your audience is when you're writing that proposal. Now, if you are getting money or applying for money from a small or private foundation, their process may be very much less transparent. They may not even have a professional reviewer looking at all those proposals. It may just be somebody in-house who goes through them and goes, ah, I like this one, kind of much more subjective. So, but that's in the right for those, those funding groups to be more subjective because it's their money that they are giving out. So they have the right to establish their own process. However, there is an international push for greater transparency and how grant decisions are made for grant awards. 
and um, also for successes and failure, failures of various types of programs. Okay, now let's say at last you get the award. Gosh, this is great. I got my fellowship. Well, when you get that fellowship, that's not the end of the line. You have to read the award conditions carefully, okay? You need to make sure that you know what your responsibilities are. And then, well, let's say you didn't get the fellowship. Well, most of us don't get the things we apply for on the first time. These things are so competitive, it can be unbelievable. So your best bet is to think, well, will they take another, will they accept another application from me? And can I get comments on my proposal? Can I get comments on my application that will help me understand how to strengthen it? And then if it doesn't, and then you can look for other funders as well to try for the next round. The main message there is don't give up. We, most of the time we don't get what we apply for. But not done yet, sorry. Okay, then there is this thing called reporting. This is where you're not done yet. If you get that money, you still have to you still have to comply with those funders want to hear from you. Uh, let's say you have a fellowship program for two or three years. They're probably going to want an annual report on what you were able to do. So you're going to need to check what the reporting requirements are, how frequently, um, what they want. If it's about your results, maybe they will even want to know about your expenditures. So if they want to know about your expenditures, you're going to have to keep detailed records, records of the money you have spent and for what purpose. So if you'd like more information on proposal writing, especially for projects, we had a workshop at ISTF in, the, in October 2021, and all the details are in the document, the Google Doc here, and that will take you to lots of different resources and uh, practices that we developed. And we have a YouTube channel with all the videos from that workshop if you want more detail on any of this stuff. Now, the last thing is, okay, so I would just like to say thank you very much to everybody. And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to receive them at the tropicalforesters at gmail.com ad address if something occurs to you after this workshop is over. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sheila. Thank you so much for all the structure and everything. So everyone, is there anyone? Uh, so the QA now is start. So is there anyone want to ask to Dr. Sheila or to Dr. Fula? Or everyone just busy just implementing the knowledge. <laughs> so feel free, everyone. You can uh, keep, I'm, I'm sorry. You can uh, raise your hand or just type that in a chat box. So, is there any question? Okay, Ikrar, please go. Can you hear me, Ikrar? You can unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Uh, okay, can you hear my voice? Yes. My audible? Okay, yes. thank you, Sister Wenning. And I have a question for the purpose. <clears throat> Uh, let me introduce myself first. Uh, I'm Ikrar from Hasanuddin University, uh, from Forestry Department. Okay, uh, I have a question that about uh, writing a personal statement. They said, in Dr. Paul said, that we cannot uh, say that we are good at problem solving, and then we cannot write it in the personal statement. I mean, how we should know about that we are good at problem solving or not, because uh, some of people say that uh, he is confident or she is confident about uh, problem solving and then one time uh, they got a, a problem that they cannot solve it and how about that uh, are we should be uh, keep uh, solving uh, I mean are we should be keep uh, writing about we are good at problem solving I mean, in different country, I have a different problem, but there are different difficulty too. That's uh, my point. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ikrar. So this is sure to be specific for the personal statement. And yes, Dr. Fola, could you please give the answer about uh, 
that things about writing confidence on writing that she uh, he can uh, he have that ability for problem solving okay thank you so much for that question so what i was trying to say in the presentation is this problem solving was used as an example and i was trying to say that if you know you cannot do something don't say that you can do it or if you just think about a fancy word maybe you saw a word maybe somewhere you read about it and you just want to copy the word and put it in your SOP or statement of purpose or your personal statement. It is wrong. Only say what you know you can defend. Only say what you think is right about yourself. Don't be vague. Don't be too general. You know, somebody can just say, I am problem solving. Which kind of problem can you solve? Can we, because it's too general. Are you talking about solving an environmental problem? or you are talking about solving mathematical questions, or you are talking about solving physics or chemistry, you don't just say, I am problem solving. Be specific about what you know about yourself. If you know you have been able to solve maybe one problem or the other in the past, or you undergone the challenges, you'll be able to overcome the challenge. Be specific, use, tell a story. Be explanatory about it, be clear about it. Don't just use a general word for it. Thank you. Any other question? Okay. Um, so for someone that asks, um, can you get the answer or you just have, uh, you still not find the answer? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Fole. I get the answer, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. So is there any other questions? So everyone don't worry about uh, the material in the presentation. We will share that. Uh, you can just, we will upload it in the tree learning web page on the IFSA website. Just uh, visit our website and you will find it in there. Mm. And we still have time, a lot of time. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so there's a question that, uh, is this presentation only can be implemented in a forestry sector or can also be applied to other fields? So let's start, uh, let's just shifting the speakers into Dr. Sheila. What do you think, Dr. Sheila? Is it only so, like, uh, can be implemented in the forestry sector? Oh, these these questions? No, this um these, this this strategy for proposal writing should apply broadly across many different sectors. Um, the 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 uh, ma many different disciplines require a similar format. It's a change in the topic, not in the proposal strategy. I. But in addition, I just gave my summary of an approach to organizing proposals. There are other ways to organize proposals as well. It's just good to start with a format. And if you want to change it later, go ahead. But whatever you do, you should make sure the format you use fits the format that the funder wants you to use. Thanks. Okay, yes. I think like it can cover the answer. So it is not only like about the forestry sector, but um, you can just do that. Like if you want to apply for another master degree and yes, Dr. Fola, you want to add something? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not just for forestry. It's just that forestry students are organizing this workshop. So what we have presented today is not just for forestry discipline. It applies to all disciplines. You know, scholarship is not for only forestry students. And proposal writing is not for only forestry students. So what we have presented today, according to what Dr. Sheila said, is for every discipline. So if you want to apply for other disciplines, they will ask you to write SOP. They ask you to write proposal. They ask you to write articles. So 
just you the idea of what we are presented today, apply it to whatever you are applying for and make sure that you get focus and streamline whatever you are planning to do to whatever you want to apply. And please, please make sure that you read the guideline. Make sure that you read what you have been asked to do so that you'll be able to know how to apply appropriately. I normally tell my students and those people that meet me that even if you want to have, if you have about 20 days to apply for a, a scholarship or a grant or a fellowship, make sure that you spend a lot of time in preparation. Don't wait till you have only two, three days left before you now wake up and you are rushing. Make sure that you study, search, write, and then customize to whatever you are applying. And I wish you success. Thank you. Sure. And we have another question, and it's really important that I think <laughs> to be answered. So how important is it to have outstanding grades in a case of not having obtained them during the degree? How can we compensate them in our motivation letter or application? So yes, let's start from Dr. Pola, then Dr. Sheila. Please, Dr. Pola. OK, that is a very good question, a very good question. Now, you know you don't have good grades. But you know, some scholarship may ask you for first class, some may ask you for second class upper, some may ask you for outstanding or excellent result. You miss that. Will I ask you to go back to school to go and have the good grade? You can move ahead with your life, but I now start generating after school experience. I will recommend you to generate after school experience. Can you be able to maybe audit for extra courses, extra training? Can you end us volunteering services? Can you render some leadership services? Can you engage in leadership position? Can you even start writing articles? Some of you may even start writing scientific articles. If you can publish paper in journals, you can do a collaborative paper with your supervisor, you can do a collaborative paper with your friends, colleagues. As long as you have publications, you have research experience, you have volunteering experience, you have leadership experience, you can all these pull them together, you can use them to enhance and improve your CV. And then you can use them in writing a very good motivation. Who knows? That will sell you better. But if they insist on having your good grade, well, try your best and leave the rest for the committee to do the selection. But you can still do your own best by doing after school experience in boosting your CV. Yeah, over to you, Dr. Sheila. Okay, I would, I would agree, Dr. Fuller has covered that very well. Um, there's other ways to show that you can do the job. I've seen people who don't have excellent grades, but who make excellent researchers. Okay. And because they have a way of looking at a problem that's really creative, that sometimes you don't capture, you don't capture all their skills and intelligence on the normal standards uh, exams. So as Dr. Fula mentioned, maybe after you graduate, you can get involved in a research effort and participate and show your stuff. There's other ways of showing your stuff that can help you find your way into graduate studies. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there an, uh, you want to give another question, Gabriela, or is it enough? It's enough, thanks for your answers. Okay, so we still have 11 minutes for the question and uh, Q&A session. And maybe I want to ask uh, for both the speaker and how about if we have like, you know, gap year on uh, continue our study. So do you think like, uh, and I mean like uh, mostly like someone from undergraduate student just go for work and then go for a uh, master like one or two years after uh, graduating from undergraduate. So, and in their work, sometimes like it's not related to the uh, research. So can we, and what do you think like if we just feel that it's not really compatible with our research in a master? So should we like um, share that experience or 
how we do that? I mean, like trying to tell the motivation like the student. Thank you. I okay. Go ahead, Doctor. Okay, if, if okay, if I quickly want to say something about that, there was, let me just give a practical example of what happened to me in the past. There was a time that uh, our proposal was there was a call for uh, a research grant, and it's for education, and they has people who are interested in looking at uh, the implication of um, hawking and household chores on education of girl child. So, and I'm a forester and I want to look at how can I be applicable to applying for a, a grant that is not targeting at forestry. But I try to look at what about marketing of forest products? Can marketing of forest products affect schooling and education of a girl child? So I brought in marketing of forest product, like non-timber forest product, like girl child going for harvesting, girl child going for selling, girl child going for uh, different processing activities in, um, in non-timber forest product. This could affect their education. So I tried to bring in forestry, not process, processing and marketing of forest products to education of girls. And surprisingly, I got the grant because I was able to convince them that marketing of forest product can influence or affect education of a girl child. That is an education grant, and I was able to win it. So you can look at how applicable, you, you always find a meeting point with whatever you have done that may not may be relevant to whatever you want to do later. It's just for you to sit down, study, and find a meeting point. It's uh, what most of our youth are not ready to do these days is about taking the pain to study, taking the pain to, uh, to, to, to search for information. It's not very easy for you to go far if you don't take the pain of searching and taking the sacrifice of getting necessary information. So please, whatever you have done, even if you study, uh, if you have gone to university to study physics, there's an aspect that can be applicable to forest. If you study chemistry, it could be applicable to forestry. There's always a meeting point. Even if you did mathematics, you could come to computer remote sensing, GIS, and all that. So always find a meeting point. No knowledge is a waste. No knowledge is a waste. So study it, try to observe it, and then you will always find a meeting point. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Paula. And Dr. Shela, you want to add something? Well, Dr. Fuller made very good points. I would say that, yes, you can demonstrate if you have an experience that seems unrelated to where you're wanting to go. In these times, a lot of us have had detours in our lives with COVID and other things that go on. It's good to show that you've been doing something, even if it's not related to the specific direction you want to go. It's good to show that you've been productive and doing something and to indicate the skills, the experience taught you, like maybe you picked up a lot of perseverance from, you know, picking, doing fruit picking for two seasons. And that had nothing to do with an academic trajectory, but you learned how to stick to the job. And that's an important skill. So those are good things to say. What the skills are you pick up from those unrelated experiences if that's been the most recent thing you have done? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sheila. So is there any other questions? So from the chat box, there's no other questions. Okay. Okay, there is one question. So. Okay, so someone just typed that um, I'm a forester, not because I chose to study forester, but because that is the course that my school gave me. So in telling my story, should I also include this part in my personal statement? So please, let's uh, start from Dr. Sheila. <laughs> I would say 
okay, ask yourself, well, I didn't choose it. It kind of chose me. And I've learned a lot from that. And it's, I've discovered that I really like it and I want to pursue something related to forestry in the future. I, I, I would say you could say something like that. If it turns out that forestry has a major impact, oh yeah, I like that. I want to go study dend dendrochronology or something. And I never would have thought of it if the school hadn't chosen me to go into, for told me I should go into forestry. So I would say that would be a reasonable way to look at it. Thank you. Yeah, let me quickly add to that. Most people in forestry did not choose forestry. I did not choose forestry either. I wanted to do something else. So when I got my, my admission letter to the university, the university changed it to change my course because maybe I did not meet the course and the, the points, or maybe the, the, there are so many students in some other related courses that I applied to. And, I received that um, um, admission letter that I studied forestry. Most importantly, what you need to focus on is what have you been able to bring out of forestry? What have you been able to achieve in forestry? What are your success stories? You can't write motivation letter by just telling them, I did not choose forestry, they chose it for me, then I hate it. I just struggled to finish it. And then now I'm a graduate in it. I don't know what the future holds in me, forestry. Those are just negative comments that will not sell yourself. In trying to sell yourself in motivation letter or in personal statement or in statement of purpose is telling them about what are the achievements, what have you made out of that forestry, even though you did not choose it. Then you may not choose it immediately, but eventually you have finished it. You have spent a whole four or five years studying it. What have you been able to bring out of it? It's now part of you. So are you now going to abandon it or are you now going to be feeling sorry for yourself because it was selected for you? I did not choose forestry. Then well, before I finished forestry, I got even my final year project. I was able to get a, a, a research grant. My, my master's program, I was able to get a grant. And my PhD, I was able to get a grant. And now here am I studying forestry, an associate professor, and very soon to be a professor. So I, I will always say that if I come another life, I will choose the forestry. Now nobody will choose. So let it be your own story too. You have already chosen a forestry, let it be part of you. And if you want to go for a postgraduate program and you know that you don't want to continue the forestry, you can move to something else, something related to forestry or something you are qualified for. Go ahead with your life. So one thing I normally tell myself is whatever I want to do in life, I'm always, I must always love it. There's a difference between a job and a profession and a discipline or a career. So don't just go for a job, go for a career. You yourself a career which can last long, not just a job that will continue to pay bills. I want to advise you, if you want, if you like forestry, keep doing it. If you don't like forestry, move to something that you know you always love doing. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Fola and Dr. Seva. So we just only have two minutes left and I think like no one uh, typing their uh, question again in the chat box. So before we end our session, let's take picture together. So everyone, please turn on your camera, please. And let's take picture together. Wow, nice to see you. Okay, please uh, turn on the camera on uh, and we can take the picture together. Okay, so. I think like uh, no one else want to open their camera. Oh, yes, we see a lot. Okay, I will take the pictures now. So I will count one, two, three, and please smile. <laughs> one, two, three, smile. Once again, another pose maybe. One, two, three, smile. 
<laughs> okay, thank you so much for joining uh, today's session. We are so happy to have you and we don't for, uh, don't worry about the recording. We will send you the email and please fill the box of uh, so thank you much, Dr. Shail and Dr. Paul. We are so glad to have you here and sharing the knowledge. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, we, we enjoyed it. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Yeah, I really learned a lot from your presentation too. There are something that I learned so new even in your presentation. Thank you so much, and for everybody, thank you so much for giving me the platform. Keep moving for SP. Keep planting more trees and keep advancing the nature. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you and see you.